Okay, I guess uh, I can start. We are two minutes in, so good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to the panel discussion on introduction of AI in the agri-food sector to all of you. Uh, I think attendees should be muted, and if you have any questions, uh, please use the the Q and A function in the in the in the box for asking any questions, and feel free to pop them as we go along the the, the panel discussion today. Uh, and yeah, like we'll have 20, 20 to 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the session to, to tackle all of your questions. Uh, today, I'd like to start by noting that Protein Industries Canada acknowledges that our head office located in Regina, Saskatchewan, is on Treaty 4 territory, the original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Saltu, Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Further, we respect and affirm the inherent and the treaty rights of all Indigenous people across this land. Protein Industries Canada has and will continue to honor the commitments to self-determination and sovereignty we have made to the indigenous nations and its peoples. Now, uh, today we have uh, three panelists joining us here to talk with us. Uh, we have Jubei Sheikh. Uh, he's a machine learning scientist with over three years of experience in applied ML and deep learning. He has overseen projects in agriculture, health, and NLP, which is natural language processing sectors, and is passionate about helping clients with identifying ML problems and finding appropriate solutions that can add business value to their organization. Jubair completed his MSc at University of Windsor and is currently a PhD candidate at University of Manitoba. Welcome Jubair to the session. And we have Jim Boy, who is the operations and program manager at Isaac, at uh, University of Alberta. For much of the last 20 years, Jim has worked in the variety of IT roles at the University of Alberta. And as a certified business relationships manager, Jim has taken on the leadership roles as a strategic thinker and problem solver and has demonstrated his ability to foster collaboration and lead teams with exceptional results. And finally, we have Todd Orman, Associate VP, Industry Solutions and Partners at Olds College. Todd is a pioneer in the agricultural marketing and technology space, supporting the introduction of agricultural brands and most recently the development of Telus Agriculture. Throughout his career with Ad Farm, Syngenta, Farmers Edge, and Telus Agriculture, and now with Olds College, he has succeeded in launching solutions that have influenced how agribusiness and farms interact with technology. And I welcome all three of you to the panel discussion today. Uh, I, I would like to actually give an opportunity to, to each one of you to, to kind of you know, talk a bit about your work, your company, and also the experience uh, you have in, in AI and the agri-food in, in general. So uh, let's start with Jubair. Yeah, sure. So uh, I think you can hear me clearly, right? So yeah, I'm Jubair. I'm working as a machine learning scientist at Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, known as AMI. And I'm also a PhD candidate at the University of Manitoba. As you may know, AMI is one of the organizations that are part of the Pan-Canadian AI strategy. Thanks in large part to organizations like AMI and the University of Alberta, that Alberta has become one of the world's top three hubs for AI research. In addition to academic involvement, AMI's teams are also working to leverage scientific advancement in order to help companies um, working to leverage scientific in help to occur in help in order to help companies to progress along their AI adoption spectrum. For example, just last year we worked with 74 companies to help them build their AI internal AI capabilities. So AMI does this through their different services. So Amy offers services in areas such as talent development and recruitment, advising companies on AI projects and advanced research and development. Personally, I have worked in different areas of AI and machine learning, for example, NLP, that's natural language processing, time series analysis, and bioinformatics, and with different industries such as agriculture, oil and gas, and medical diagnosis. Specific to agriculture, we partnered with National Research Council Canada and Climate Corp to improve the quality of crops or production of crops. This, currently I'm leading these projects now. 
My PhD research is also in agriculture where the topic is how we can create a better variety of crops for a new environment from genomic and environmental data. I have also worked with the researchers of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada for creating these resistance varieties of barley. That's all about me. Thank you so much, Jupiter. Um, next, Jim, like, do you want to go next? Sure, thank you, Sai. Um, yes, my name is Jim Boyce. I'm with ISAIC, which was previously known as the AI Hub. Uh, we are situated at the University of Alberta, and we are basically an infrastructure as a service provider. So we actually think of ourselves as your friendly neighborhood cloud. Um, so we have GPU enabled compute resources in the data centers located at the University of Alberta. We started as um, a project really with a principal investigator in electrical and computer engineering and a number of local businesses that were finding it difficult to, to find um, affordable and local compute resources for their AI and machine learning projects. So our mandate really is to help the growth and adoption of AI and machine learning in Western Canada. We are partially funded through uh, what is now called Prairie's Canada. So we're able to offer infrastructure at rates that are significantly less than the major commercial cloud providers. Uh, of course, data stays local to Canada, uh, in our case, in Alberta. Um, we work with others in the ecosystem, uh, such as Amy, um, and I was down to the, the AgSmart uh, conference uh, that Old, Olds College hosted earlier this summer. So we're working with local startups and innovators um, to accelerate their projects. Uh, we also work, of course, since we're at the University of Alberta, working with, with researchers at, uh, at our post-secondary institute, as well as others. And so our goal is not only to help startups and innovators, but also to fuel the pipeline of talent. And so we're working with academics uh, at the university and other post-secondaries to provide compute resources for student projects um, and, and in some cases to um, uh, support industry and academic partnerships uh, that, that have a, a commercialization aspect. Um, we work, of course, not just with Amy, but with others such as Cybera, uh, in, and, and the, the sister organization in Saskatchewan, BSRNet, and, and Canary, uh, as sort of the umbrella organization that looks after high-speed research internet works across Canada. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, we have a small team of machine learning experts and, and technical folks. And in terms of helping others in the ecosystem, um, often what we can do is provide those connections, sometimes to academic uh, researchers with a certain area of uh, subject matter expertise, or to others, for example, with Amy, uh, data scientists at Cybera. Um, and so we, we provision our resources to those companies um, at rates that are, as I say, very affordable and uh, accessible, and uh, make it easy to onboard and easy to offboard. So, uh, that's a little bit about Isaac. And I guess for myself, I've, I joined Isaac full time uh, over a year and a half ago. I've been at the University of Alberta on and off for over 20 years and have been involved in technology projects uh, throughout, throughout pretty much the span of my career. Uh, I will now turn it back over to Sai. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, Todd? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm Todd Orman. I'm the AVP of Energy Solutions and Partnerships here at Olds College. So our office is the office that develops the strategic relationships with companies and donors and sponsors that interact with Olds College. And uh, Olds College itself is an agricultural institution here in uh, central Alberta. And we've got a bit of a mandate to kind of drive ag. And a lot of that uh, mandate kind of is focused around technology and the dissemination of information around technology. So what makes Olds College unique is really our physical infrastructure. So we've got 3,600 acres of farmland, we've got a thousand head feedlot, uh, we have a major event called AgSmart that disseminates information. And so to that end, we leverage those uh, assets to basically introduce and validate and test uh, basically technology. So in the area of ag tech, what you find is that it is still relatively a new uh, area. So, you know, if you go back to really kind of say 2013, 2014 is when you've seen Climate Corporation kind of get bought out by Bayer. That's when you see a lot of the mad rush into ag tech. You, you did see earlier pieces in play in this from a deer perspective, but really I'd say that's what kind of got a lot of people interested in it. So it's really nascent. And in the area of uh, 
ag, of course, it's a different environment than you're going to find in an office building, right? Now you have a natural uh, environment. And that natural environment means that your data sets probably aren't quite as nice and clean and its architecture is much more difficult. Collecting that data is very difficult. And then if you look at your uh, users, well, if you look at the primary side, you're looking at someone about my age, roughly about 56 years old, you know, been trained in areas uh, such as uh, agronomy or animal husbandry, not so much on technology. So your users are difficult as well. So what I find that Olds College does very well is it provides an environment for technology to kind of foster. So you, for example, if you think about how uh, tech is developed through agile development, well, that's great when you have lots of cycles, but when you have a single cycle in a, in a full year, that is difficult to validate and develop your technology. So here at Olds College, uh, we provide an environment where we collect data and create training data sets to manage and develop algorithms. And then we also have that ability to actually showcase the technology through things like AgSmart. Now, my personal background is, is a little bit more around uh, the commercial side. So I've been with Olds College for roughly seven to eight months. Previous to this, I was with uh, TELUS Ag, where I was the first ag guy uh, to help develop their strategy and did a lot of M&A work. And that was very much a data-centric strategy. By the time I left, we had about 1,600 employees operating in about uh, 50 different countries with uh, staff in 10. Previous to that, I was a VP of product for Farmer's Edge, a very data-centric company as well. Um, and we launched that into Australia, Russia, Brazil. Uh, so lots of commercial learnings on that front, a little bit more than I wanted to learn actually on that front, but there were lots of commercial learnings. And then, uh, well, I did spend a stint as a VP with UFA. I also spent a lot of time in data at Syngenta. And there was much more from a marketing perspective where we collected data from a program management. So I've had a pretty extensive time uh, with data and data within ag. That's, that's wonderful to hear, Doc. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, from from there we can jump into some of the uh, questions and, and start some conversation here. Um, so, uh, like, I, off the bat, like, what is the potential, or what potential do you think AI has in in terms of helping agri food businesses in Canada? And and I, I, I like Todd. Like, you can start off the discussion. Sure. So. I think like data and AI and machine learning are, uh, I think, essential to what's going to happen uh, coming down the, the pipe. So when you look at a lot of technology in the area of agriculture, it is getting much more mature. Future yields, uh, future ability to manage things like uh, emissions reductions is all going to take data, right? So future uh, pieces are probably not going to look at a, how do you apply a product in a single field? It's like, it's not just about chemistry in a field or fertility or seed. Honestly, now you're gonna have to start looking at it at a much more micro, micro level. So you're going to have to match soil to the right chemistry, to the right seed, and not at a field level, but at a much more smaller micro level. That requires data, that requires algorithms. That's what it's going to have to be. Same thing when you start looking at genetics. If you start thinking about the pressures coming down from an environmental perspective, there too, we are going to have to report and actually start matching soils to fertility and pieces like that. Those are all data systems that, that are needed to make that happen. Now, those data systems are out there, but again, I think we're very nascent in terms of how we are executing that. And be candid, there's probably a lot of learnings, both from a farm side and from a development side in terms of how those that environment actually works. Jaber? Yeah, sure. So the, um, uh, regarding the potential of AI, I think it can be divided in two parts. One is uh, before harvest, as, as Todd is mentioning, and, one, and another is the after harvest. So Todd actually covers everything, almost everything regarding the before harvest. So I'm going to focus a little bit on what we can probably, what, what AI can do, especially after harvesting. So 
there are lots of applications. If you take a look at um, look at the market right now, there are lots of application of AI for sorting or grading food. For example, um, if 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 a tomato, if, if this tomato issue is, is it a grade one tomato or is it a grade two tomato? Or sometimes you can probably use your mobile camera, take a photo, and that and that photo will tell you what's the grain quality or the what is the grade grade of this grain. So, and then another application of AI, especially after harvest is food industry supply optimization. So, you know that there are lots of energy that are in the, in the refrigeration system, there are lots of energy that are, that's been consumed by the refrigeration system and optimizing those energies is, we are in a world right now where energy is, uh, we are going through an energy crisis in different parts of the different parts of the world. So, optimizing energy consumption is a, is a is is an extensive uh, area where AI is working right now. And another important part that's coming up uh, from the recent research that I find out, especially during the COVID, AI to ensure hygiene standards of uh, egg to food. For example, when the um, when the when you are handling the food, how are you maintaining? Are you wearing a cap or are you wearing the glass? So there is a company in China who are working in something like this. They are, they install a couple of cameras, and from those cameras, they are detecting that whether all the employees they are working um, are they are hand, they are handling the food safe uh, safely. And adding to Todd's. Uh, point so before har harvest so if you see there are lots of companies or there are some companies that starts working that they send the drones in the field and the robots in the field they take a couple of pictures from the field and and in the, from those pictures they're trying to identify whether the crops are ripening or is there any pesticides in the in the field or the, or or they need to apply any pesticides in the field or is there any herbicides or disease in the crops so building variety another sector where i work a lot that's the building variety of crops for a new environment so suppose you're growing crops in canada now you are you want to grow the crops um, same crop you, you want to grow the crops in united states but in a desert condition so at that time are this are we if we sow this cross are we going to get the get our expected yield or which or which lines of the cross or which genotypes of the crops we should sow in the in in, in that desert condition depending on the environment because if in canada if we suppose we are collecting uh, these crops are sown in Canada when we have when we have a standard environment like we have lots of, we have optimum amount of rain and and the and the field condition is optimum but that in the desert condition that we are not get, going to get the same environment right so if we if we sow these crops in there so there should be some differences between the yields and and if a, if a if a genotype is performing well in Canada, that may not perform well in the United States in that region specifically. So identifying which lines of crops or which lines of seeds you should sow, that's another active research area, uh, which is going to be a big sector in the next couple of years, I believe. Yeah. Wonderful. So we there we kind of covered the pre-harvest. Uh, Todd, you mentioned you know emission reductions and and the chemistry that goes into the farm. Jabir, you kind of touched upon the pre-harvest genetic side and post-harvest applications that you potentially see where AI could be applied. Like Jim, like I want to ask you, like do, do you have any other comments uh, and potential well, maybe, applications you see yeah. for AI? Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, maybe just a couple of examples that that come to mind and. Actually, when Jabbar talked about uh, image image uh, analysis, it reminded me of you know a couple of things that are that are um, where there's advances um, taking place, and that is, for example, you know, uploading a, a picture of a, a crop that might have some kind of disease, and so and getting diagnostic services you, you know over the internet, um, but certainly the energy and water optimization things like that. At the U of A, there's a project called. Um, Sorry, darn it, I forget the name of it, but it, it has to do with aquaponics. So where it's an integrated system of um, sort of harvest, um, growing fish, I'm not sure if I, I'm not using quite the right name, but raising fish, uh, but also um, 
using using the um, the water that's used in the fish production uh, in in also the hydroponics for the plants and optimizing the nutrients that are extracted by the plants, recycling that back into the, to support the fish population. Um, but then there's another interesting application that I don't think uh, this company will, will will mind if I mention them. Uh, Precision AI uh, and Todd, they were down. You would have seen them at, at AgSmart, but. Uh, the idea that low-flying low flying drones with cameras, equipped with cameras, are able to take real-time pictures of crops uh, and able to differentiate what's the crop and what's the weed and actually do precision spraying of just the weeds. Um, so really amazing technology that, that uh, you know, would help reduce the amount of herbicide into the food, uh, food chain. Uh, of course, tremendously uh, decrease the amount of um, product that needs to be applied. Um, so some interesting things there in terms of uh, image analysis. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. So what do you think are the challenges that uh, you might have enc uh, encountered or you know, companies would encounter in, when, when trying to implement AI solutions? Like, and how do they overcome them? Like, like I, I'll start off with Jubair. Like, what are the challenges for actually looking at AI? Uh, so... The first challenge I face is regarding the data. Uh, as I work mostly with the genetic data and I have also worked with uh, some text data from field notes. So what I find out that in most of the times the data are incomplete and 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 these data sources are these data are usually heterogeneous. For the genetic data, for example, uh, we may not have that much amount of data. The reason is, because if you want to, um, if you want to, we we to collect the genetic data, you need to wait for the whole growing whole growing cycle whole growing cycle, and then you probably get couple of uh, you couple of samples, and and then even if you have the genetic data, another important thing, the cross actually or crossing act in. Uh, interest with the environments a lot. So there is when we are looking at the protein content of the cross or, or probably the yield of the cross, environment has lots of effect on, on them. So that means that we, what, what does that environment means? The environment consists of the soil and the weather variable, and it also sometimes related to the, to the field management. So we may get the data from, especially in Canada, we 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 may easily get the weather information because in in Alberta we have lots of weather information. I'm not sure about the other provinces. Um, in Manitoba, I know that we have also some weather stations. Um, but soil data, like what's the pH of the soil, what's the amount of the carbonate or phosphate in the soil, those kind of for getting those kind of data for the whole growing season, you need to install some kind of sensors. And those data, we don't have those kind of data usually that comes up. So we, I didn't see much amount of those kind of data. So that's another issue. So when we are working, especially if we want to build a new variety, getting this data is crucial, but I saw there is a very limited data sources that, we, uh, that are available right now. So I would say that we, Probably having a data collection strategy is very important in this case. Yeah. Todd, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, maybe maybe to, to build on that a little bit. Um, so there's a couple of things maybe to, to look at. So, so one, uh, data in agriculture is really disparate right now as well. So we do not have open platforms. Uh, you know, green does not always mix with red. This sensor doesn't always mix with that sensor. And so that, that's one of the challenges that we have. Uh, so data tends to be locked in various areas and there's no common way to bring them together. So that creates difficulty in the collection of the data. The other thing to also mention is you gotta remember in agriculture, where we have connectivity is where people are, right? So when you think about AI, uh, you are going to need that ability to transmit data on an ongoing basis. Uh, today, uh, that works very well in an urban environment and slightly outside of maybe a major highway, but not necessarily in a field. So most technologies, for example, from a robotics perspective, re relies on swarm, right? You are going to have to download a map. The machine's going to have to follow that map. You're going to collect the data. 
and then you're going to have to utilize it. You're not going to be able to put an, a camera on right now to simply look and identify a slough or a rock pile because you don't have that connectivity in the field to do that. So that makes that a very difficult uh, proposition. So those are things that we have to work on and we have to think about those ways around it. Most often, data is collected as you uh, come within connectivity and then bring it forward. And then again, the other aspect is we're in a natural environment. So you just don't have that same ability to set up sensors and all those pieces the same way you're going to have it in an office. So what the strategies for collection data and making sure that data is clean uh, is really uh, significant. And I, sometimes I think we overestimate or underestimate, sorry, that that challenge when we set things up and the work that goes into that. And then maybe one final piece on this is in a bit of my own personal soapbox. When you're in ag and you travel uh, globally, I mean, you see that places like Brazil have amazing agronomic conditions, same with Eastern Europe and everything else. But what makes Canada really successful is at one point in time, we put investments in railways, ports and roads, and those structures uh, were very successful for us uh, to basically make ag. I do think there is places here where we need to think about how we invest in the digital infrastructure on a, in a rural area, and that may be around connectivity and common data structures that could actually enable this. Because I think we're going to have to think through how we collect and manage data and create those consistent data sets to drive AI. And that's a, a strategic investment that we're probably going to need as a country. Wonderful. Uh, Jim, do you have uh, any further comments on, on the challenges? Yeah, maybe just a couple of things. So I, I was talking to uh, the CEO of uh, another company that we're working with, and that's called One Cup AI. And I asked him this question because I didn't have the first hand experience to, to bring, uh, you know, to, to, to really effectively answer it. But uh, touching on Todd's comment, it was the broadband uh, internet connectivity was one of the things that he mentioned. And interestingly enough, he said, you know, Jim, there's there's it's there's starting to be solutions and so he was talking about Starlink, uh, this uh, you know mesh low low orbit uh, satellites. Uh, I did have a look at their their website really quickly. They do cover up as far as Fort McMurray, um, and so you know through technologies and I think as Todd said, depending on uh, how our governments want to uh, perhaps invest in additional infrastructure to connect rural communities. But there may be there may be other alternatives. There may be options that we can get that high speed connectivity uh, that that in some cases is needed for the types of applications that AI and machine learning uh, are bringing to to the field. Um, the other thing that I'll just mention the other challenge that uh, that I was told is a little bit about the uptake of the technology. And Todd, you touched on it. It it may be partially due to demographics, um, and so you know we have. And I, I read some statistics, but I can't remember the average age of a farmer, for example. But um, even at, at uh, AgSmart, it came up that if farmers are close towards the age of retirement, they're not that likely to invest in, in some of these high tech sorts of solutions. Um, and so it, it may take some of that uh, refreshing of, of um, I guess, the folks that are running our farms and, and have the right kind of background or, or more background and more acceptance in terms of uh, adopting technology into their operation. And so I maybe just to, to build on, on what Jim is saying too, he is correct. It's the average age of a farmer is 56 years old, right? And it's just nothing. Data and information is not what we've uh, trained a lot of people on. And if you look at the AI sets that we would need, or the data sets that we'd need, some of them do require, you can leverage a sensor for it, but some of them still require a manual entry. So if you're going to have, you know, a growth stage model or a disease model, you're probably going to have to identify what the variety is. There's no way to identify a variety unless someone puts it into a system. So the UI, UX, or the user interface for the farms have to be fairly simple and as easy as possible to get that in play. When you talk to deer or you talk to a lot of these companies, uh, they joke around and they say the number one variety seeded is A or 1 because it's the simplest thing to put into a monitor. Um, that, so we do have to think really hard about those things that we're just not going to also collect from a sensor. Uh, and that means we are going to have to rely to some extent on farmers entering uh, data into systems to drive AI. Good to hear that. So kind of following up on that. So I think all three of you have touched upon the challenges on the, on the agriculture side, but when we think about the industries or processors or manufacturers, like in that setting, what are the challenges do you 
see like in terms of ai adoption like it doesn't maybe it's not specific to food industry but in, in general in manufacturing what are the challenges to do do you, do you see so i can maybe start with it and just build again and this is from my my experience at uh from talus perspective a little bit so so one i think we do also underestimate the complexity of that supply chain so when you're looking at something like a, say a strawberry or something that's much more easier to track and trace and develop it right you're going to take the what's coming directly from the field put it in a package put a qrg code and you're going to be able to look at that now when you look at other things that are ingredient based so for example you know let's take a look at a cereal crop that cereal crop is going to uh, come from a specific field which has to be geofenced it's going to move into and commingle into a bin which is going to have to be collected on it's going to move most likely to an elevator that's going to be in a thousand ton uh, thing to be commingled again, and then it could move on to a an eighty ton or eighty ton rail car, a forty ton rail car moving to the coast. So that complexity of that supply channel hasn't been mapped out well enough to think through how it goes for. So what you find a lot of times is supply chains tend to go from processor, you know, where something is packaged, and you have a supply chain that you can then track track it through. And so, again, it really depends upon commodity when you're starting to think about how you're going to maximize those supply chains. And so right now, I do find that when we, when I was, we were looking at technology in the agri-food space, a lot of it was more marketing based, you know, how to measure things and run programs on a shelf than it really was about how you would process or track because it, it was more complex than I think people thought. Makes sense. Jim, like uh, you have experience working with the industry, like what challenges did you see in your experience? Well, I, I think the one that comes to mind and, and Jabbar touched on this is, is the data itself and understanding what data is required, not just the volume, but also the, the quality and consistency of that data. And so where, where we find um, often is, is, what we find is often helpful is for companies to have those conversations early with somebody with data science expertise. Um, so that, that might be somebody from an organization like Amy, um, Cybera in Alberta, uh, we often partner with in, in these kinds of um, sort of these early conversations. So I think that that might be one thing um, that, that certainly can be a challenge. And, and of course, the earlier you can sort of sort those things out in terms of um, the types of data that are required and, and how to collect it. I think Todd, you talked about that, that as well, that depending where you are, um, the sensors and, and these sorts of things, um, you know, are certainly a factor in, in terms of gathering the right data um, and, and, and the sufficient volume as well that's required for some AI and machine learning models. Adding, adding to that, I would say that one of the important thing is to even before even before start collecting the data, I would say that one of the strategy can be defining the business problem with the data that we want to solve. That's that's the key thing because we can collect a lot of data. For example, we are collecting, it's not, the example is not related to agriculture, but yeah, let me give this example. We are collecting a data from river. What's the density of the river or what are the species that or what are the fishes in this river? And then we want to find out that at the end, we find we find out that our business problem is how we can measure the height of the building. Right. So so the thing is with this example, what I mean is we need to before if anyone wants to work with AI, it's probably better to define the business problem first. And then based on that business problem, we want to, uh, they, they may start collecting the data. And for manufacturing, especially, or for the supply chain, there can be lots of potential. It starts from um, taking food from one place to, or taking the agri-food agri from one place to another. We can, probably we can do root optimization, or we can probably uh, tell that, with this grade of the, or with this quality of this agri-food, 
you may not take this food beyond this point because the food may be may got rotten this this is may this problem may not be present in canada but i know that this problem is present in in lots of part of the world because when they're trafficking the food or when they're taking food from one place to another sometimes a lot of food got wasted so we want to reduce that right why i'm telling this because let me give you an, a statistics by 2050, if we want to feed all the people of the world sufficiently, we want we need to increase our food production by 50 percent right now. What from what we are predict, what we are producing right now, and according to the another statistics, I can't remember the studies. Probably come from the FAO. Um, so they. Uh, they measured that right now there is 175 million people who are suffering from extreme hunger. So this means that whatever the resources or whatever we are growing right now, it's very important to preserve their, it's very important that we are use, we are maximizing the use of them. Makes sense. So you, I, it's interesting, like you kind of touched upon the food waste and and how we can use technology in, in kind of reducing the the food waste. That's stuff very interesting. Um, so continuing on that uh, discussion, like I I want to ask you, like some of the traditional sectors in general, like there is a lot of data, but a lot of data is unstructured. It's maybe not collected. It's maybe not stored. Like agri-food, I would say, like kind of falls in that sector where you know companies or, or agribusinesses have been collecting data for, but it's, they're they're mostly unstructured; they are not stored. So, when engaging with these traditional sectors, like what kind of strategy do you take, or AI companies should should be you know following, uh, you know, when when engaging with these agri-food businesses or some of the traditional sectors in your experience? I. Um, I can take this question first. So I I would say that whatever the data is available, start. So the first thing is, if they want to work with this, probably coming up with a data strategy is important. So, and if someone tells me that I, yes, I'm going to have a data strat strategy, but right now I want to start my business. So. I still tell that that's a that's a, that's a good motivation, if uh, because we st we still have some kind of unstructured data, so if this data is text data, we don't have any problem to work with. But in sometimes what happens in in most of the cases that we saw a lot of, as I said, so probably from one place is collecting one kind of data and another place is totally ignoring this kind of data and collecting other types of data. So that's the major challenge here. So if that if that's the case, then I would say probably start building some things, probably start from the statistical model, even not touching on the machine learning model, but start having a data collection strategy. That's very important. Jim, do, do you have comments on that? No, I, I didn't really have anything to add. Um, I think in, in our case with Isaac, we're, we're often uh, more working with, with the startups um, and, and actually at more of the, I'll say, proof of concept stage. Todd? Yeah, so, so maybe to, to build on that, there's a, a couple things. So, so when you look at that data strategy, I do think you have to think about, again, who your audience is and where you're collecting it from, right? So your go-to-market approach and I know it, it seems to be uh, anti-tech, but you really got to think about how you're going to interface, interface and communicate with uh, farmers and ranches and, and the user. And in agriculture, that may not be a traditional methodology. It may use some of those same practices, but you really got to think about, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, the audience looks a lot like me, right? They, they're older and they are, you know, big fat thumbs. And so uh, how you interface with them and how you set that up and the more simpler you can get it, the more likely. So I do, I do also think it has set the right expectations. Now, the other thing to say we didn't really touch on yet um, is having a controlled environment. And so that what is the other piece of which I find interesting in this space. It's still extremely data and AI related, and that is vertical farms and controlled environmental AI. 
And on those fronts, data collection is much more uh, simpler because you actually can build the box that it comes in. And now we're dealing with not necessarily challenges around data collection and everything else. It's much more around energy and then size and scale and where that and business models support that. Uh, so that's a little bit different. And I, I don't think that's going to solve all our food problems, but there definitely seems as a lot of startups in that space are coming through here as well, especially here in Alberta. That's another area I do expect will supplement our food supply, especially for those things that come for three to 4,000 miles on a truck, right? Uh, so those, those are in, in process. And I've been surprised at how many of those companies have come through the Olds College uh, because there you've got usually engineering and data guys uh, that don't have the horticulture background, right? But yeah. clearly lots of investment going there as well. Um, we we do have an audience uh, question that, that just uh, came in. But I just want to remind the, the participants, like if you have questions, please do use the Q&A um, uh, chat box to, to kind of ask those questions. Before uh, I move to the audience question, like uh, one question I, I kind of want to uh, ask each one of you, like what is the most important piece of advice uh, that you have you have related to the data businesses collect for their AI work? Like what is the, the piece of advice that you would give the, the companies that are here today in terms of data they, they collect for, for, for AI project for the businesses? I can go first. So um, let me give two advice here. So one of these, one of them is related to the AI ethics. So we need to be careful about farmers' data privacy and data ownership. Sometimes it seems like sometimes it, there may be a conflict arise between the agricultural, agribusiness, intellectual property, and the protection of farmers' data ownership. So we need to probably address those address those issues because whatever the farmers are going in their field, it's uh, and the data they are collecting that's probably their property. So that's one of them is from the AI ethics perspective. And another is, I already touched upon it a little bit. So collecting all data is good, but collecting business specific data will be will go an extra mile for um, for tackling any kind of AI problem. So understanding the domain is very important. These are the, my two advice. Todd? Uh, so it is all, all about data. And uh, when I, I worked for Farmer's Edge, uh, I used to like the CTO used to tell me he, uh, he needed always, he didn't want any more architects. He just needed more lumber uh, is what it came down to, right? Um, which I always found interesting. So that whole strategy around how you collect data, I think is really important to Jabbar's uh, point. And then the other thing too, I think you got to think through that it may be iterative. Sometimes I think we're always hitting, looking for the home run for the, with a lot of these uh, systems and products. And we can probably start a little simpler and the simpler to, is really more about foundationally creating that process to collect data and, in, and actually interfacing with those front ends to collect the data in the right way. And then think about how you iterate on that. I mean, you didn't go from a candlestick phone to a mobile phone overnight. I do think at times we are sometimes going way too far, way too fast and not thinking about the, uh, the first basic processes in this. Jim? Well, I, I think, um... I think Todd and Javara both, you know, have covered this uh, quite well, but I, I think it, it comes back to that, that question of business value. So what is the problem that's trying to be solved? And I think that having clarity about that is really important. And is it bringing value to the user, whether that's the end consumer or anywhere along that supply chain, but, but certainly being clear about what's the business problem we're trying to solve. And then having those conversations with data science folks to say, okay, well, to solve that problem, you know, these are the data points that we're going to need and, and they need to be collected in a certain frequency and we need to have a certain volume or, or um, quantity of, of data in order to do these kinds of analysis. So I think that those sort of having those early thoughts uh, at that, I'll say sort of ide ideation stage. Um, and and there's, there's organizations that can, can be very helpful in terms of um, you know, sort of vetting some of those ideas 
and starting to put the pieces in place to, and I, and I loved what Todd said about sort of that, that incremental approach, you know, not, not necessarily trying to hit a home run, but, but thinking about minimum viable product, um, you know, they, like they say, sort of uh, fail early and fail often, but, but, you know, do it in an iterative kind of process so that you're learning as you go and, and you can sort of change course a little bit to corrective, uh, corrective strategies as you, as you um, flesh out those ideas and, and uh, uh, understand more fully what, what data is required. Makes sense. Adding to, Jean's and, yeah, uh, sorry, adding, to, adding to Jean's and Todd's point, probably having multiple, when if after defining the business problem, probably having multiple partners to cut collect the data it will accelerate the process because in agriculture or in agri-food data collection is usually not that fast. So uh, having multiple partners or multiple areas, working on multiple areas may, uh, may make the data collection process out faster. Okay. Um, so I, I have a couple of uh, questions from the audience. I'll, I'll jump into those now. So we have the first question. So how can agri-food organizations uh, build a culture of comfort around AI and also build the ability to use AI from an employee skills perspective? Jupiter, like you have worked with the plant, so maybe I can start with you. Yeah, sure. So, so comfort, um, if you want, if I want to talk about comfort around AI is, you can, I would say that the first thing would be to get a family, get a little bit familiarized with what AI can do and what AI can't do, and what understanding what's the benefit and risk of AI. So, uh, for example, AI can, uh, if you have a, if you have a good AI model, it can increase your business or, or your, it can increase your agri business a lot. And if you have a if you have a bad AI model, it can probably cause a lot. It can probably uh, cause a lot lot of loss in your earning. So, uh, so understanding what AI does uh, or what what is the capability of AI that is very important. That that will be the first step, and and then working with organizations. I'm not I'm not talking. Working with organizations like Amy probably will will help. I'm not talking. I'm not telling that you need to work with Amy only, but organizations that work in the same way. So when when you are working with us, what we usually do, we usually make it a learning process for you. So that means that while we are working on your problem, on your business, specific business problem, we also want to. Uh, build your in-house capability by training by training you or or giving you the insights how AI and machine learning works. That's that's another way. So Jibir, there you kind of touched upon the programs that uh, that Amy has, and like, you know you work with SMEs and and organizations of all sorts to kind of develop their internal capabilities, right? That's yep. wonderful. Uh, Todd, like, do you have a perspective coming from the business side and now working at a college? Yeah, so I, I'll go back to some earlier in my career. So early in my career, I worked for Syngenta, and really my data systems were that we were developing were CRM based. You know, it was like back in the early days of Salesforce.com and and pieces like that. And when we first put those in, they failed miserably because quite honestly, the users didn't see the, the benefit in it, and it was way too far out of their current use patterns. And so what I've even found that's been adopted well in uh, the ag sector is when you're enhancing a current process that's not too far away from what they're doing. And so you're building on ways of working that are well established, and then, then it kind of works well. Now, today, Salesforce.com and sell, all those CRM systems, they're very standard. But creating fun funnels and putting that data in, all that, that was really unique. And a lot of sales guys were not necessarily measured by it or seen a benefit in it. And it wasn't until you kind of changed your process around that, that you actually started seeing how that data collection was actually being utilized. And I think the same thing when you look at ag, you got to understand the processes that are there today and kind of enhance them and remove some of the barriers in that process to get them engaged in the data collection. Um, and it may, again, it may be small things first before you get into the big things. Wonderful. 
Jim, like, do you have a perspective around? Well, I just just add one thing, and and certainly uh, I, I love Todd's comment about enhancing a current process. Mm-hmm. You know, so so the question was around, um, you know, building that culture of acceptance and, and comfort with AI, and and Jubar, you mentioned this. I think finding success stories, right, and and sort of seeing well, how are others applying it, and how is it benefiting them? How is it helping? Because I think this is the shape of the future. Um, you know, this this is uh, has huge potential across so many different areas. Um, I think that. So one thing that comes to my mind, and and I don't know if there's a parallel in Saskatchewan, but Cybera in Alberta have something they call the Data Science Lab program, I think they call it, but it it um, pairs up the budding data scientists with with industry um, folks from industry, and it could be agriculture, it could be anything, but they come with a problem or a project, and Cybera brings the experienced data scientists and um, and mentors um, new folks who are, who are looking to start in this field. And so again, maybe just I, that idea of building that culture of acceptance um, is, is to try it in a, in a low risk way um, and, and sort of think through, well, what might be a problem? What might be a, an application? And, and let's explore that. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, I have another uh, question from, from the guest. Are data science methods considered in the storage mediums or warehouses that are part of the transportation processes? So I think they are talking about the supply chain. Yep. So there are lots of applications of data science and um, and machine learning, specifically in the supply chains. So I already gave an example, like in the refrigeration system, you can probably optimize the energy or if you, when you're sorting the foods. So uh, in, in that sorting, you can apply machine learning, which, which, which are better tomatoes, which are worse tomatoes like that. So grading the food, so uh, grading the agri-food. So that's another um, application of AI in, um, in, in, in a warehouse or, and for regarding the transportation, you know that um, now um, there are lots of vehicles that are transporting foods that uh, in those vehicles, we have lots of different sensors. From there, we know the position, where the position of those vehicles and we can do a route optimization. So the, so the, so those charts probably reached, reach their destination quicker than, quicker than ever. So, um, and, also another application I was kind of touched on it. So when you're transporting the food, uh, we need to make sure that the foods are not getting rotten. So that's that can be um, that can be another application um, while you're transporting and the foods to or agri foods to different places. Jin Todd, like do you have any inputs on, on the supply chain side that you want to provide? I, I don't, sorry, not that side. Wonderful. Uh, I, um, I, yeah. Oh, sorry, but I was just going to say, I, I don't have a lot to, to add to that either, but it does occur to me that uh, around this idea that Jubar mentioned of, of route optimization, so just thinking about optimization uh, at all phases, I guess, but, but sort of this idea of using predictive analytics. So uh, I'm not sure if it applies to a warehouse, maybe it's more of a production kind of a thing, but sensors that collect data, um, so it's around asset management and it's around um, sort of predictive, um, looking for anomalies, uh, the ability to, to use data in a predictive way rather than a reactive way. So, um, you know, we see this in uh, vehicles and, and uh, I imagine also in, in sort of factory settings where information is coming in and, and we can predict instead of react um, to certain conditions to keep, keep assets and keep equipment running. Excellent. I, I kind of have an uh, connected question on the supply chain. So over the last few years, we have seen so many supply chain disruptions like in every industry, not only in the agri-food industry. So are there examples uh, that, I don't know, like, Jubair, like you can give maybe like where AI has helped build better solutions in terms of supply chain, the innovations that have happened recently, if you are aware, like if, you're, if not, that's, that's okay. Nothing come in my mind specifically here. Okay, that's that's okay. Yeah, just just out of uh, curiosity. Um, we have a third question. 
So regarding the connectivity issues, has the government, the government of Canada's Universal Broadband Fund been an effective initiative in helping facilitate the uptake of broadband in rural communities? Are other levels of government providing similar support for investments in broadband? I, I don't know if the, any of the panelists have I can, an answer for that. I can speak a little bit just from my tell states. Now, I don't know that specific fund very well, but I think a couple of things come to mind, right? So, so first of all, like even to the where the question was, you got to remember some of the connective issues are not in a community, they're in a field. And so the business model for connectivity right now is based upon density of people, but you need to build connectivity where you have rattlesnakes and antelope, not necessarily people. And so that's a bit of a challenge. And so some of the things that I see happening on that is the, and you know, uh, Jim and Jidbar kind of alluded to that too. Um, there are solutions like Starlink that are being built out and uh, Star Solutions, which you know leverages that and others, but they're usually around private networks versus other pieces. So how do you enable a private network? That is a significant piece. And if you're in the rural area, you build a farm out, you're gonna put your own water in, you're gonna put your own you know, hydro in it. There may be a need to put that, but how do you enable that? And then the other thing that becomes really significant in that conversation is spectrum. So today's spectrum auctions are really developed again around urban populations. And there has been some conversations around use it or lose it, i.e. if you've got spectrum, you absolutely have to use it. You know, again, the, the telcos are, 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 the best thing to do is put it where you're about a bunch of users. And so that makes it difficult with spectrum. And there may need to be a differentiation between what happens from a rural perspective and an urban perspective to enable this. And so those are conversations that I know are happening. I don't think they've uh, been solved. But, but I also know from a TELUS perspective, their definition of rural has changed as well, right? So when, when I was at TELUS initially and you talked about uh, connectivity, anything under 10,000 in their mind was rural. Rural to me was the field where there was no people. So just even having that conversation and bringing that awareness to that, that uh, issue, uh, I think is important. It's starting. Uh, but we're not yet solved. So I don't know if it's always some money problem, to be candid. There's some real structural issues in terms of go-to-market business models uh, that have to be solved to kind of build out that infrastructure. Thank you so much, Todd, for, for giving your insight on that. Uh, I don't see any other audience questions, and we are also at the end of our allotted uh, time. So I, I, I think I would like to end the session here. Um, just want to thank the, the panel panelists here for, for your time and also want to thank the audience for joining us today. And I also want to mention uh, to everybody here, like please do take time to visit the Protein Industries Canada's AI program. We are encouraging companies to put forth their projects um, that utilize artificial intelligence to grow the Canadian plant-based food, feed and ingredient ecosystems. So uh, I know you can, you can visit our website for more information. We are currently uh, open accepting expression of interest and that would happen uh, the, the final date is november 9th so you know if you have any questions do reach out to us once again thank you so much everyone thank you thank i uh, thank everybody for joining us today thank you have a good, great day enjoyed it thanks guys thanks very much